Good morning. I want to welcome you to Memorial United Methodist Church. My name is Joe Cade. I'm the pastor here. We're so grateful that you've joined us in worship. If you've traveled here to join family, if you're uh, uh, new in this town and you've joined us, if you've been in this town and you've joined us, uh, we're grateful that you're here and joined with us. We have a bulletin that guides you through our entire service and also has a number of our announcements. And we like to frame our announcements in our five practices that um, help us make the decisions that we make. And those five practices, one, a radical hospitality. And with that, that, I'm going to invite Erin Knight, our children's director, up. She's going to talk about wonderful Wednesdays. As she does come, I'll tell you that we have a new newsletter out for this month. It's in the back. If you'd like to have one in your hands, we have printed ones in the back and also on the bulletin boards on either hallway. You can just take it right off the bulletin board and take it home with you. Or we have them by email and also on our website if you'd like to read them on a device. Good morning. I'm Erin Knight, Director of Children and Family Ministries, and I'm excited to at last begin our wonderful Wednesdays for the summer, this Wednesday at 9 o'clock. Um, children will be signed in in the same check-in spot as usual on Sunday mornings, and then they will come up to the straight room in the middle uh, right on the top floor of the FLC. Um, we're going to really enjoy our time together. It's a, an opportunity for parents to have a, a little quiet time on Sunday, mo uh, excuse me, Wednesday mornings, um, but also it's a time for children to really go deeper in their faith while having a lot of fun. So we're going to practice three of the five practices each week, um, focusing first on radical hospitality this Wednesday. Um, kids will be invited to bring a friend with them who's maybe never been to Memorial before, and also a picnic item to share, peanut free please. Um, but we will have a picnic, have our Bible story at the picnic, and then we're going to take a little wagon downtown and give away free lemonade um, to people who pass by on the street. So I hope that will touch people's hearts to see the kids wanting to be generous. And um, we will do our best to practice radical hospitality. Uh, June, excuse me, July 19th, we will study passionate worship. Uh, we'll come in here. We'll talk about the many ways we can worship. And um, that week, kids are invited to bring a dollar stuffed animal for a baptism activity. Uh, Risk-taking mission and service will be on July 26th. That day, we will um, actually go to Greer Relief. I know some of our fourth and fifth graders were disappointed at Bible school that they actually went to stock the, the kitchen there the pantry and they got locked out of the building so that was not what we had planned but every child that comes to wonderful Wednesday ages three through fifth grade can that day um, go to Greer Relief for a tour and help stock the pantry there um, and then we'll have a fun day on August 2nd, Water Day. Um, some of you may have seen the fire truck come spray kids with hoses. Um, that will be August 2nd. Uh, it's not as violent as it sounds. <laughs> um, but anyway, we'll have a great time. I hope that your children will join us. And um, it is 9 to 11 starting this week. Hope to see them there. We believe in passionate worship, and as part of that, we're arresting all of our uh, actual uh, paid staff and our volunteers who give us so many hours, so you're going to see very different combinations of musicians in both worship services in order to give them a break, in order to give them rest. And today, for that same reason, Reverend Fred Parker, is one of our retired clergy in our congregation, is um, preaching as I'm coming off vacation. He is, uh, has made his career in tax preparation on uh, Highway 29 between us and Spartanburg, but is also a second career pastor who served churches in the area. Fred will also sing from the pulpit because he's from the choir. You'll never see me sing from the pulpit with the choir. Uh, Dennis also, should he preach, would also sing from the pulpit. That will not happen with me. Um, Fred and his wife Debbie are both in the choir, and Fred's sister is married to Bishop Will Willeman, who has been here um, in worship, and we've used a number of his books. So lots of connections between Fred and the community in our church. We're grateful you're here. Uh, we believe in intentional faith development, and I encourage you to find uh, the podcast that I do each week. We didn't do it this week because of the holiday, but you can go, I'm sure you might think, well, what on earth is that? You just go to Google and type in Sunday Scripture Podcast, and you'll find it. And it's a 15-minute show that sets you up for the week to come. 
uh, um, with a discussion of the scripture passages. We believe in risk-taking mission and service. And I want to give you an announcement for parents. On July 23rd from 5.30 to 7.30, our youth will care for your children as you can go out on a date in the area. And they'll take um, donations and those donations uh, will be given away. We believe in extravagant generosity. And I want to encourage you, if you can get your quarterly statements by email, if that's no trouble to you, I encourage you to write our office manager, Jimmy, and ask for that. If you want them in paper form, we will absolutely do that and hand it to you. Um, but if you'd like it by email, please um, do so. I believe that's all of our announcements. So if you'll stand as you're able for our first hymn, number 729. Let us now affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The first scripture reading today is from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, 
impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is adultery. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. This is the word of God for the people of God.
It's beautiful. Thank you. Prayer is such a critical part of the life of our church, not only on Sunday morning in worship, but throughout the week. And we want to give you the opportunity to participate in the prayer life of our church. We have a group that gathers every Tuesday morning to pray over the concerns of the church. And if you look in the passionate worship section of your bulletin, you'll see a number that you can call and leave a message. If you have an emergency throughout the week and would like us to know, please call that number. If you'd simply like to share a prayer with us to be prayed over throughout the week, please let us know. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we speak of forgiveness. And at times we cannot forgive others. At times we cannot forgive ourselves. At times we cannot forgive you. And for that we apologize. We're grateful for your patience this day and every day. And we ask that as we hear the text today, as we hear Jesus speaking to his disciples, setting the tone forevermore of what forgiveness was to be, we ask that you open our ears anew to it. Inspire us this morning, Lord, as we pray the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. It's now time for our offering, and you can give in the plate as it comes by, and you can also give uh, digitally, as it says in the bulletin.
One of the privileges of uh, being asked to preach is I get to pick out the second hymn. At least I requested it. And it's one of my favorite ones, and it's one of everybody's favorite ones, I think. Abide with me. No, this is not a funeral, but it says a lot about asking God, asking Jesus to abide with us, not only in death, but in life. So is Don situated back there? All right, so let us stand. Well, we're st standing, so number 700, abide with me. Maybe see. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto thee, O Lord. It's a pleasure uh, to preach for uh, this morning for you. And I've had seven, eight, I don't know, nine years experience preaching in small churches, and I love it. And if someone uh, asked me what kind of preacher basically I was or am, I would say that uh, it's more a teaching and not a con condemning kind of person. Uh, I like to take what Jesus says in the, in the scriptures, what Paul says in the scriptures, 
and try to make a sermon, try to make just one point that you can take away to help you in your life in the coming week. This morning I named uh, my sermon entitled A Three-Legged Stool. And I did that because I think our faith, I think our church is kind of like a three-legged stool. And as you know, if you take away one leg of a three-legged stool, what will happen? It will not stand. It's impossible to make a three-legged stool stand. So it is with our faith. So it is with our church. But I look at the first leg, or one of the legs, as grace. And grace, we are saved. Paul says it best in Ephesians, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So no one can brag about everything they do. God's works are very important, but I think we are supposed to do things, do good, because we have been saved. We have been saved by the grace of God. Good works is what we do because we are saved and we want to do good by feeding the poor, clothing the naked, as Jesus commanded, ask us to do. The second leg is love one another, or love. I'm not talking about, uh, when we talk about love in the church, in the scriptures, it's not that romantic kind of love we all had for someone, uh, that special someone that made our heart go pitter-patter. That's not the love we're talking about. We're talking about agape love, which is the supreme love. It's the love that Paul speaks about in Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient, love is kind, etc. But you may have this question about love. Jesus asking us to love one another. Does that mean you have to like everybody, their actions? Do you have to like your neighbor, what he does or she does, the dog that he or she has, the trash in the yard? I got a neighbor down the street who never abides by the rules of our subdivision. I don't like him. I don't like what he does, but I am, we are, we required to love that person. It's like one of your children. Most of us have children, and they, one time or another, have disappointed us. You don't like what your child did but you certainly love that child. And so it is with God. The final leg this morning, and I'll spend the rest of the time talking about it, is I think forgiveness. In my opinion, and a lot of opinions, is probably the hardest thing Jesus asked us to do. And before I begin, I would like to say one thing about Jesus' teachings, his commandments. They're right straightforward. They're not complicated, but we all know that they are very, very difficult for us to accomplish. For example, turning the other cheek. Jesus says this, pray for your enemy. Love God more than your own family. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it away. Love all. Forgive all. It has been shown throughout the ages, though, that if we love others, if we forgive others, if we care for others, then our lives will be richer and much more rewarding. Our lives will be pleasing to God. 
And our text this morning that I've chosen is Matthew um, 18, verses 21 through 35. And I'll just read the first two verses for now. Hear the word of God. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Now that, those two lines of scripture was taken from the uh, Revised Standard Version. If you look at the King James Version, it says you, Jesus said to forgive 70 times seven. Jesus had been known to use hyperboles, unrealistic statements to make his point. And this is one of them. Forgive 70 times 7 or 7 times or 77. It is easier for a camel to walk through the eye of a needle than to get to heaven. That is, a, uh, Jesus is overemphasizing a statement, how difficult it is for us to get to heaven. But Jesus is right. Forgiving others is hard. It's hard to forgive one time, just much less seven times or 77 times. A well-known theologian says this, and I quote, forgiveness is not natural. It is not a universal human virtue. Vengeance, retribution, violence are more natural human qualities. And if we think about it, that is so very true. If we are serious with ourselves, we really are a get even kind of people, not a forgiving kind of people. We want to get even. I'll show you. I'll pay you back. There's just something in our DNA that makes us want to get even and not to forgive. A little example here I came across. There once was a pastor who quit and started medical school. And his reason was, he said, folks don't, do, don't want spiritual health. They just want to feel good. After practicing medicine for a few, few years, he quit to go to law school. His reason? Folks still want to feel good, he said, but in the end, folks just want to get even. And that makes them feel good. And that is so very true. When Jesus responded to Peter with the 77 times get even scenario, Jesus is telling Peter that forgiveness is not about math. It's not about keeping score. Forgiveness is an attitude, a way of life. It's a matter of the heart. It's all about being a follower of Jesus, about being a Christian. It's the third leg of our stool. Now the rest of my scripture is about the parable of the unforgiving servant. And I will read this. And after Jesus uh, responded to Peter forgiving seven times, he goes into this parable. He says, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him canceled the debt and let him go. But then that servant went out. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. 
Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went out and saw others standing in, whoops. He refused and went out and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I counsel that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now don't get uh, too worried about this parable as we shouldn't get too worried about some parables. I don't think if you don't forgive like this servant didn't forgive, uh, we're going to be thrown into jail and tortured. It's just a hyperbole to get to point across. The king had mercy and forgave. The servant forgot about that mercy and went out and roughed up another servant, if you will, because he owed him money. God in his mercy and grace have forgiven us when he gave up his son on the cross. Now what do we do? Go out and can't forgive. Rough up our fellow man. This certainly is not very pleasing to our God. The point of this parable is that having a forgiving spirit, spirit is crucial to life, especially in our church this morning. Yes, that means each and every one of us in this congregation, no exceptions. Doesn't matter how long you've been a member, doesn't matter the amount of your annual pledge, nor the number of classes you taught or your position in the church. These are all perfect examples of doing good works. They are necessary to keep God's kingdom, but they aren't enough for salvation, for it is by grace that we have been saved and not our works. This morning in our epistle reading in Colossians, Paul is writing this letter to one of his churches in Colossae. There's some infighting, and Paul needed to remind them of a few things about what he taught them and what Jesus says about the church and how they should treat one another. And I wanted to just lift up two lines from the scripture, from a first scripture lesson that was read. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Now here is Paul talking about forgiveness. And we all know that Paul, was part, besides Jesus, was instrumental in the church as we know it today and its growth. And if you know a little bit about Paul, his prior life, he persecuted Christians. He didn't believe in their faith, but here he is converted. Here it is, he has been forgiven. And now he is starting and preaching the gospel all over the world. 
Well, this is all well and good, but why are we being asked by Jesus, God, Paul, to forgive others of their trespasses against us? What is it going to mean to me if I obey this? After all, we humans are very selfish animals and it's hard to overcome that. You might be asking, what's in it for me if I love, if I forgive, if I believe in God's grace? If you are honest, you know the deal in the church. Someone doesn't speak to you in church, I'll show them. Oh, my mother was not visited in the hospital. I can't forgive that. I'm going to leave the church. My husband was sick at home for two weeks, and no one from the church came to see us. That's unforgiving. I cannot let go of that. The list goes on. We church folks can be tough on one another if we are honest, but Jesus asked us to be just the opposite. Paul asked us to be just the opposite. Kind, gentle, forgiving. I like this I recently came across about forgiveness in the church. It says this, and I quote, the fuel that drives the church is forgiveness. There is no gospel without forgiveness. There is no relationship to God without forgiveness. And I would add that there is no relationship with one another. There's no relationship with someone you love, family members, without forgiveness. So this morning I ask you, who is it you cannot forgive today? Who is it that did you wrong who needs your forgiveness? That's eating you today, that can't let go of it. This individual deserves punishment, justice. Jesus is telling us today to forgive that person. He knows until we do, you are going to be, or we are going to be the one who is persecuted and not the perpetrator. Someone was saying, you may have heard this little quote about forgiveness. Not forgiving someone is like drinking poison and waiting for the other to die. But in fact, we are the ones that will die and die an agonizing, unforgiving death. But you may say, well, Jesus, this is 2017. This is not 30 AD when you were talking to Peter. Be, real, be a realistic. And uh, you just don't understand the wrong that I received by my fellow man. You never will. You don't live in this time. No one is going to treat my child that way and get away with it. It's just something I'm not going to forgive if they hurt one we love or you love. Maybe you've seen the movie or read the book, The Shack. Debbie and I watched it the other night. I gave it about a three star. The thing was incredibly long. Um, but I got, almost got about halfway through it. I almost gave up and went to bed, but I stuck it out. And I'm kind of glad I did because the moral teaching there was, it was a good moral and it was about forgiveness. In summary, a father was in torment because a evil person kidnapped his little girl, eight years old, while they were on a camping trip. He never saw her again. The family never saw her again. They never, they never even found the body. So he spent his life in a attitude, an attitude that God, how in the world, if God is a loving God, how does he let this happen to my little girl? And that's, I mean, that's a question that has been asked. Why do bad things happen to good people? And there's really not a very good answer. 
But the father was tormented, and he was invited up to this little cabin. And he, in the end, learned through fictional, these three fictional characters that represented Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. He learned through them how to forgive this person who killed his daughter. He needed the Holy Spirit to help him, though. But in the end, he was able to say, I forgive you. So this morning, forget about the math, 7 times 7, 77. Let's just start trying to forgive someone just one time. Begin the process against that person that hurt you and did you wrong. And it needs, it needs to be a way of life for us. This is not easy stuff. It's hard stuff. But it is necessary stuff. Grace, love, forgiveness. In all likelihood this morning, you are the one who is still suffering, not the perpetrator. Surprise that person. Tell her, I forgive you. And I might add that we might need to ask for forgiveness to someone that we hurt. We all know the story, most of you, of Lisa Beamer, who uh, she lost her husband in the uh, terrorist attack, the plane that went down in the fields of Pennsylvania, killed everybody on board, including her husband. She was being interviewed by one of the morning shows, and she says she works very hard to keep resentment under control. Forgiveness is a process, she says. She knows she can't do it all once at once, but over time, it will happen. She will forgive. She said, finally, it is not going, I am not going to let the terrorist take anything else away from her. And what she meant by that was she is going to go through a process of forgiveness so that she cannot be tormented for the rest of her life over what happened. So my fellow Christians, all this about forgiveness is predicated on what happened over 3,000 years ago. Jesus hanging on the cross, innocent, God's son, a most perfect person, wrongly accused. And while he was dying, he was able to say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. When we recite the Lord's Prayer, just like we did this morning, let us take the words seriously. When it says, and forgive us our sins, just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. But we must forgive those who have sinned against us. To be clear, those who have broken the law, whether it's a civil law or God's law, yes, we should forgive, but they must pay a price for their wrongdoing. But sometimes we want to play God and carry out justice, the payback, the get even, instead of the forgiveness part. But let's remember this. God said in the scriptures, justice is mine, saith the Lord. Justice will be served, but we are not the ones who should apply the justice. This is God's business. Our role is on the forgiveness side. So let it begin today. Not alone. You can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. But we can through the help of God and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Morning is 390. Um,
Rebecca picked this out, and I want to thank her for that, because it talks about forgive our sins as we forgive. There's so many uh, hymns in our hymnal, a great Methodist hymnal, that is a sermon into themselves. And this song speaks to that about forgiving our sins. So let us stand and sing 390, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. that you joined with us today. We know that you're going to miss throughout the summer for a bunch of different reasons. I encourage you to go to our website and find our services uh, under the Passionate Worship section. We have people who put a great deal of time into making sure that they're there. We're grateful that they're there, and I encourage you to find them uh, as you travel all over the country this summer. Thank you, Fred. Thank you both for singing for us. We appreciate that. Thank you all for being here. Go forth in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the power, and the presence of the Holy Spirit go with you all. Amen.